Uh, we were talking about uh, Kushbir Kaur. Yeah? Nobody knows, sir. Huh? Uh, there, is, there is a, by the way, there is a six column article on her today in the Times of India. Very moving one, which sets the context for this book. India Unbound, which had a profound impact on my life, and I'll tell you how. Well, when I read the book again, reading some books is like watching a Bond movie again. You appreciate it, you like it, you like the character, you know what's going to happen. But reading this book again was like watching Casablanca again. I discovered new meanings. I appreciated it all the more. But also it was a very agonizing experience. It's not a happy book. It talks about India, it talks about the dark times. It talks about a lot of tough things. And if you are a patriot like me, if you feel things, what went wrong, then you will really be touched by this book. What is it about? Is it an autobiography? It is, actually. And the character is not somebody else, it is Mr. Das. Am I right, sir? It is you and your family. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, it is an historical account of India pre-independence, post-independence, and post-liberalization. It is a book of economics. You tend to understand economics very well when you go through this book, even if you are not an expert at it. But most importantly, I read it like a lyrical novel with India as its muse. The story begins in the days of the Raj. And some very poignant observations from that time have been made by Mr. Das. Let me give an example. He says, when the Brits were teaching us India, uh, English, they were teaching us all the values of freedom, thinking, openness, while practicing exactly the opposite on us here. So such were the times. But you know, that's far behind. Personally, I am more interested by what happens after the days of the Raj. This is what happens. From 1947 to 1987, in the 40 years post-independence, if I just take one parameter, many have been mentioned in the book, our share of global trade, it went down by 80%. A major indicator of the health of an economy, of a country's relevance in the world, went down by 80%. We were not too high, we were just about 2%, and we went down to 0.5%. How is that possible to achieve after independence? We had the basics in place. We had the agriculture. We had the world's third largest railway network. We were producing some things. We were a large domestic market. But we never focused on exports. We killed competition. And we killed free market. And this was the impact. The Industrial Revolution, the first one, passed us by. And one has often wondered, how could that happen? With all our glorious past, with the Vedas, with the Upanishads, with so much of clarity of thought, how is it that the Industrial Revolution couldn't have taken place in India? I never had an answer to that. This book gave me an answer. And I'll share that with you shortly. There's no right or wrong answers, but I must say that is by far the most convincing argument that I found yet. But what about now? What about the current times when we have all the parameters in place? Why didn't it happen still? So the answer lies in possibly our four varanas. And this is a little trick I play very often after reading this book, because I was also ignorant before reading it, that how many varanas we have, how many you know, divisions we have in the society, and everybody says four. Brahmin, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras. And we don't talk about the fifth one, a typical case of our hypocrisy, the untouchables. We all know they exist, but we somewhere bracket them in shudras, okay, that's how it is. And when the mandal happened in 1990, 89, 90, and suddenly there was this big fat reservation for the OBCs, all of us were left wondering, where did the OBCs come from? 
you know, we already had this reservation for the SCs and STs. What is this OBC thing all about? So this book gave me this beautiful answer, this insight. What it also touched upon is that why the Industrial Revolution could not have taken place in India in context of these Varnas. Because the Brahmins, the educated ones, were the thinkers. They had the right to think in the society. The people who were working with their hands were the Shudras or the untouchables combined. And they were doing backbreaking work without improving upon the implements they were using. And the Brahmins who could have done that were loath to touching anything from their own hand. So the twin should never meet. They could never connect. So people kept using the same old things and they never improved upon them. And industrial revolution was not just James Watt waking up one day and you know steam boiling in the kettle which is what we are taught in the beginning of our history or geography and saying Eureka here is how you make the steam engine. It was not like that. It is a series of iterations, series of improvements upon daily life machines and a whole society does it and then you create a typewriter or a steam engine and things like those and they simply couldn't have taken place in India. It was a beautiful explanation for me. But by the same account, there was another revolution which did take place in India, which is the IT revolution, which the book beautifully explains that because our Brahminical instincts kicked in, and we were here to think. So the same engineer who would not want to work on the shop floor would work at the very same salary in a BPO, not adding much value, but feeling very happy because he's wearing a tie and going to an AC uh, environment to work. And he's doing, he thinks, great things. So which is why the IT revolution did take place in India. Beautiful explanation, sir. And amazingly, he has drawn parallels to the war between Porus and Alexander before Christ, that how and why Porus lost this war. And we still continue to lose this battle every single day in our society. How it personally helped me? I may be sounding negative. No, I'm a very positive guy and I try to take positive out of everything. When I read this, I said, Eureka. Wow, what an observation. So in India, people will not take the trouble, the brilliant minds would not take the trouble to do things with their own hands, to dirty their hands as we say. So very good, let me get into that. So I was heading this company, Sodexo, we were doing this meal voucher thing, everybody would have used it sometime or the other. And there was an opportunity to build some other businesses, which Sodexo does globally. Being a French organization, they take pride in serving food, making food and serving food. In India, it was the domain of the unorganized sector. For 25 years, Sodexo had been studying the Indian market, and they said, no, no, not possible to build catering business in India. So I raised up my hand, I said, listen guys, let me do it. They said, but you, you are not a chef, you are an engineer, you are doing this voucher thing, you know, it's a financial product, you don't know a thing about food or facilities management, which is essentially a glorified word for housekeeping. I said, don't worry, I will do it. And I said, I'll put the best minds on the shop floor. I'll put, put the best minds with the chefs inside the kitchen. I'll put the best minds with our housekeeping boys in the offices of clients and let's try to differentiate. My CFO, he said, boss, if you want to do this thing, I'm not a part of the company anymore. I let him go. He was a co-founder of this company with me in India. I let him go. I said, I don't want to believe in these things, you know, this Brahminical attitude towards the poor quality things. And I'm happy to share with you, today this company employs 105,000 people, more than one lakh people in India doing these humble things. <laughs> Somebody beautifully described Mr. Das as a brilliant economist with the heart of a middle-class Indian. So I'm taking the liberty of calling him a middle-class economist. Simply because in this book, he beautifully answers so many of the questions that have haunted the middle class for so long. Things like, don't go in the slide, it's, it's just a model for wage goods economy. So what it means is, why India did not adopt a wage goods model of growth after independence. Instead, 
We went for hi-fi things, the biggest power plants, the biggest steel plants, the biggest dams. It was all nice, you know. India needed that too. But India also needed the wage goods model, which means people want to consume. Let them consume. Let people produce what they have to consume. Simple. So the Asian tigers, to begin with Japan, then Korea, then Taiwan, then Malaysia, then Indonesia, everybody adopted that model. And we were sitting on our high horse. Profit is a bad word. We cannot allow the businessmen to make unfair profit, so just keep the economy closed. And we simply didn't let that happen. Yesterday, the IKEA store opened, right? There were 40,000 people who visited the IKEA store on the first day. So we are still hungry. And we are still not producing enough. The License Raj. I mean, there are pages devoted to License Raj, and I was fulminating. I was so angry when I was reading it, even though I know. But you know, revisiting that is so upsetting. A beautiful sentence that leaps out of the book, that in India, you could go to jail for producing more medicine than you were licensed for in times of an epidemic. For saving lives, you could go to jail. There was a clerk sitting somewhere, not too far from here, who would decide whether the Birlas can set up their new plant, or what technology would Tata's be allowed to use in their next steel plant. Now, how crazy can that be? Nationalization. So why am I saying all this? All of you know this, right? But I think it's important to revisit history. This is a history book. It's not an economics book. Because we forget the lessons of history so easily. And they come back to haunt us. With nationalization, we killed everything. We killed our insurance firms, the best airline in the world that we had, the banks, emergency. One thing led to another. And the legacy of Babudam. So we are trying to set up a plant today, a factory. And despite all this make in India, made in India noise, I can tell you it's still as difficult to set up a plant in India. Every single day somebody comes in, I see a lot of nodding heads in the, in the crowd and I think it touches a chord. But I can tell you it's what a nightmare, you know. You simply want to throw up and say, listen, I'll keep getting this stuff from China, what the heck, you know. But no, we are going ahead with that. So then finally, liberalization happened. Because we were forced to liberalize. There were planes loaded with gold flying to England and suddenly we woke up and we said, my God, we are going to get killed because, you know, Indians don't sell gold. So we have to liberalize. So under force, under pressure, we liberalized. Yes, some things did improve after. So we were there with Kushbir, Kushbir Kaur. Kushbir Kaur was born in Amritsar. She's 25 now. She won India a silver medal in power walk, in walking, 20 kilometer walk. She's planning to get a gold. She's targeting a gold in the upcoming Asian Games starting next week. When she was growing up, she didn't have enough to eat. And enough to eat means she was not that she was not getting her daily diet of proteins and milk. She was skipping one meal a day every single day for years. And some days, two meals a day out of the three. She was sleeping in the cow shed because the house was dripping. And we want such people to get medals for us. And this is what Mr. Singh tells us. India is a rich country inhabited by the poor. Why the heck? So I am full of rage. I am not happy with liberalization. I am not happy that I have made personally a success out of myself. I am actually filled with rage. How the hell could this happen? And I think the book addresses these issues very well. And that's why I love it. The Holocaust, all of us know it by heart, it killed 6 million people. According to me, 600 million people have died or have lived lives worse than death in India over the last 60 years. On the positive note, every, crowd has a, every cloud has a silver, silver lining. So what Mr. Das really celebrates is the spirit of the bazaar, the verb of the banya. 
And when he was standing here today, I was trying to imagine in him that 22, 23 year old guy who was sent by his CEO to feel the bazaar and how he would have gone and spoken to the dealers and distributors and retailers and shopkeepers and try to understand what it means. And this is the spirit he really celebrates. And you know, it changed my life again. Why? Because growing up in a middle class family, government servants, as, as parents, we always looked down. We were taught to look down upon the businessman. When the Maruti came in 1984, and a few of us, a few of our neighbors started driving Maruti, we were told, Are, wo businessman hai. Kala paisa hai. So we just assumed that Kala hi hota hai paisa. And I lived in that lie for so long. I could never imagine myself to be a trader, a businessman, a lala. Till the time I read this book. For the first time I understood the contribution of the Baniya, of the trader, the Marwaris to the Indian economy. And I was so upset. Why do we hide all this? Why don't we celebrate that? This book celebrates that. It gave me the conviction to become an entrepreneur. And 10 years back, I took that decision. I think it was an unfinished agenda in my life, despite all the other successes in my career. And today, sir, when we did that exercise, 30 second, close your eyes and imagine you were to be dead in the next three months. You know, I was thinking, I'm happy at home. My wife is here. She has an equal contribution in my journeys. And thanks to having become an entrepreneur and really creating something in India, I'm happy at work. And I thought to myself, I don't need three months. If I were to die here today, I have no regrets. Thank you.